patient, all-knowing, he counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Sing verse one again. What love could remember? No wrongs we have done. Omniscient, all knowing, He counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins they are many. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn, our sins they are many, His mercy is more. So tender is calling us home. He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. Sins they are many, His mercy is more. Verse 3 What riches of kindness He's lavished on us. His blood was the payment, His life was the cost. We stood neath the death we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. So much more, His mercy is more.
your, your love pursues us. Lord, it is astounding that though you know us, you know us, there's nothing hidden from you. And yet you still pursue us. Lord, you call us by name. Lord, your mercy is astounding. Your grace, Lord, your love for us is inexplicable. But we know it's true. Thank you for this truth. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear, coming after me. You pursue us. Shadow, you won't light up. Mountain, you won't climb up. Coming after me, your love. Snow wall, you won't kick down. I, you won't tear down. Coming up. There's no shadow. is our prayer this morning. Lord, we are in need of your mercy every moment of our lives. Lord, thank you for your abundant mercy and grace. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Please have a seat. Good morning, everyone. My name is Pastor Che. I'm the EM pastor here at Cleveland KCPC Church. I hope and pray that wherever you are, that you're all safe and growing your love for guiding each other during these difficult historic times. Just have a few announcements for the young adults in college. I heard that you guys had a great prayer and worship night this past Friday, um, led by Yenna. I don't know if Yenna's here. I heard it was really good worship. Uh, there will be a Bible study for the college and young adults this Friday um, as well. Uh, as, uh, actually, just the Bible study this time. Also, we have a retreat for the college and young adults uh, on Labor Day weekend. Let me just give you a little bit. We'll give you more updates next week as well. But um, it's the dates of not, uh, September 2nd to sept September 4th. They're gonna, you guys are going to stay overnight at Beulah Beach. It's a really beautiful place. It's only like an hour or so away. Uh, we'll, we'll be sending out a Google form this upcoming week for people to sign up if you're interested in serving at retreat. Um, It'd be great if as many people as possible who are attending the retreat can also serve. We've had, uh, back in the day, we had a few people serve and you know, we, don't, we don't want to put too much of a burden on them. Also Google form would be email and EM Facebook page. And there's gonna be a sign up to serve and we'll be sending out a separate form for sign up down the road. 
And the next week, we'll give you more details uh, of, of the retreat, the theme and everything, and the speaker. Also, just um, this really good news. Um, I, don't, I don't know, remember David and Joy Wei. They just uh, they have a new child, okay? His name is Zion Asher Williamson. I mean, Wei, okay? Zion Asher Wei. And, uh, and so um, he's not sleeping hardly at all, okay? I think he's six pounds something, but there's St. Louis. Uh, Joy's doing her fellowship, I believe. And so they're going to be there for at least three years or so. So please pray for David and Joy. Um, I wish I had a picture, but uh, he looks just like Joy. I think he looks just like Joy. And so, uh, but yeah, please continue to pray for them. Uh, seems like we seem to have a lot of babies these days. Also, just start building hope in the city. Uh, as you know, since September, we got a big outreach event. Uh, we'll give you more details about that. If you have more questions, you can ask Anna Ceballos. Uh, also, um, if, you want to, if you want to volunteer, as you know, if you haven't taken a class, you have to take a class uh, to be able to volunteer. For those who've taken classes, it's pretty much permanent. You don't have to take a class ever again. And also, if you want to donate some clothes, uh, please let me know or Anna know. Uh, Common Threads is uh, there's a donation drive constantly for people in financial need. Also, please continue to pray for all of our first responders, medical professionals, teachers, parents, and students as we continue to march along this pandemic endemic. Okay, endemic. All right. Oh, one last thing is today's the last day to sign up. It's the forms out there um, for the nomination of our deacons for EM deacons. So if you have any, uh, uh, so this is today's the last day. Uh, for, for deacon uh, nomination, okay? If you have any questions, you can also contact me or Elder Kate for that. At this time, we're going to have a time of offering. Father, we are so grateful for just all the provisions that we have, that we take so much for granted. May we have a grateful and thankful heart. We thank you so much for giving us the greatest gift, your son. We thank you so much for the opportunity um, for us to bless others, to give to others, Lord. May we continue to do that as followers of Jesus Christ. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you could all stand up, let us join together in confessing our faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth in the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Knowing that we've all sinned and fall short of God's glory, let us confess our sins to God together at this time in silence. Friends, believe in the good news of Jesus Christ. In him we're forgiven. Amen.
Oh, gracious Father, you who are so kind and forgiving and patient with us, you say in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, love is patient. You are so patient with our indifference, rebellion, with our, uh, our thoughts that are not from you, but from the world, for our pride and arrogance, thinking that we are the ones who built ourselves. Forgive us for our sins. But we know by the graciousness of what happened on the cross, we're completely forgiven and completely righteous in your eyes. We thank you so much for that truth and that promise. We continue to pray for this church to grow spiritually, to be ever more kind, to be ever more gentle, to be ever more fruitful and profitable in the ways of the God. We thank you so much, O oh God, for all the incredible things that you have done and continue to do and will do through humble servants. We are so thankful for the people here. We're so thankful for creating each one of us in the Imago Day, the image of God. We thank you for the different generations that are represented here, from the very old to the very young. And for those who are traveling, who are, who are not here, bless them, Lord. May they, be, may they grow and worship wherever they are. And for those who are here, we pray for open and kind hearts and broken hearts. Please, oh God, to the truth of Scripture. We thank you for this prayer that you taught us 2,000 years. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. If you could turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through 7. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through 17. Sorry, 1 through 17. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through 17. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through 17. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. They're the kind who warm their way into homes and gain control over gullible women who are loaded down with sins or swayed by all kinds of evil desires, always learning, but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so also these teachers oppose the truth. They are men of depraved minds, who as far as the faith is concerned are rejected, but they will not get very, very far, because as in the case of those men, their folly will be clear to everyone. It's a final charge to Timothy. You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, my per faith, and patience, love, endurance, persecution, sufferings. What kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra? The persecutions I've endured, yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed, and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God, servant of God, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. This is the word of God. You know, uh, World War II, I love history, as you guys know. World War II is one of my favorite Okay, it's not my favorite, it's a terrible time, but it's my more knowledgeable period of history that, that I know of. It's part, a lot of it is because my dad, he was really into World War II. He ordered this huge like, annual of World War II Time Magazine, has pictures and stories, and he had like, like 30 to 40 books. And I remember reading it as a kid, as a weird kid, and I just got really into World War II. And I, I don't know if you know that much about World War II. It's, it's one of the few wars where there was a clear, I think, evil and good, good and evil. And um, one of the last battles that happened in the European theater was called the Battle of the Bulge. And many of us, I'm struggling with the Battle of the Bulge myself. 
and it's a losing battle for two years. But the Germans, I think December 16th, 1944 to January 25th, 1945, launched the last offensive against the Allied forces. It was their last gasp for help, a desperation, as the Allied forces were about to invade Germany and destroy the Nazi regime, okay? And uh, well, Hitler threw basically everything at them. And, and at one time, they actually had more men than the Allies in this battle. And so in, initially, things were going really well for the Germans for two reasons. One, they had more men and manpower at that time, but also it was one of the worst winters in European history. Okay, there is constant snow. It was extremely cold, one of the worst in a hundred years. And um, there's, there's no, uh, there's air cover, it was cloudy. So the American Air Force, which is far superior to the German Air Force at that time, could not bombard and obliterate um, the, the German army. And so there's a general named George Patton. I don't know if you ever, you ever heard of George Patton? He's a famous general. He actually awarded a medal um, of all people, a chaplain, okay? And it's because he ordered the chaplain to pray for the snow to lift and for the, for the clouds to break up so the Air Force can come and bombard the heck out of the German army. And indeed, and that's what happened. The chaplain actually prayed and the skies opened and the American Air Force obliterated the German tanks and artillery and all that. And he got a medal for that, for his, for his prayers being answered. I wish I got a medal every time my prayers got answered, okay? Well, one of the key cities during that battle was a city called Backstone. It was in Belgium, okay? And this city was very important, okay? If the Germans broke through the lines or broke through the city, basically there would be a huge wedge, a huge bulge that separated the Allied armies, the British army in the north and the, and the American armies like in the south, okay? And there was a Brigadier engin- um, general his name is Anthony McAuliffe, okay? He's going to be famous, and this is why. His forces were surrounded by the German, um, uh, German army. There's no hope of rescue or, uh, or escape. So the Germans knew this, but they also didn't want to waste their men and their you know, artillery. So they offered him unconditional surrender. Just surrender. We'll treat you well. And you know what General McAuliffe said? He sent a one-word response to the German ambassadors, to the translators. He said one word, and it's very famous. It's in the annals of human history. He said this, one word, nuts, N-U-T-S. That's all he said, nuts. You guys know the story? Nuts. And the Germans are like, I don't speak German, you know. I don't know, I don't, you know, Wiedersehen. I think they said something, was hat er gesagt, or something like that, okay? Was, what, I, don't, I have no idea, okay? I don't know, but they, they, they're like, nuts? They couldn't translate it. And then they realized when he said nuts, he says, no way are we going to surrender. You're nuts, N-U-T-S, okay? And so when George Patton heard about this, he says, this man and this army is worth saving. So he marched his army into southern Belgium to Backstone, and he or- that's when he ordered that chaplain to pray, and the skies opened up, the Americans won. Okay, they marched into uh, Berlin uh, five months afterwards, four months afterwards. You guys know the story of the 300 Spartans? Okay, remember that in Narrow Passageway? I think there was a movie about it. Okay, it's not completely true, that movie. But they held up 500,000 Persian soldiers because of the Narrow Passage, and every one of them died. Remember King Leonidas says, give them nothing, but take from them everything. Okay, Sparta, right? and they all died, okay? I mean, we love stories like that, don't we? There's just something about stories like this that just carries defiance, that carries stubbornness, unrelenting stubbornness. We love this kind of stuff, don't we? We love this kind of character traits in people, unless they're the character traits of your kids. We don't like like stubbornness, defiance, okay? I'm so glad that Koreans are not stubborn at all. So glad, okay? I'm just kidding, okay? But that's what 2 Timothy chapter 3 is all about. This is Apostle Paul's last book before his death. This is his final call to his lieutenant, Timothy. You know, last week I preached about a text from John chapter 13 verse, you know, and talked about it was one of his last, Jesus' last words to his disciples. And I said last week, I'm not going to teach you guys anything new. What did I say? Just love one another. Very simple message. 
Well, today I'm going to teach you some of the last words of Paul. And it's very simple. You ready for this? This is very profound. Very, very simple message. Read the Bible. That's it. Read the Bible. Next week, I'm going to teach about the Bible will transform your thoughts. The week after that, I'm going to talk about prayer. Okay? Okay? So I'm going to call this four-part series, sermon series, the No Duh series. Okay? Love one another. No duh. Read the Bible. No duh. The Bible changes your thoughts. No duh. We should pray. No duh. Okay? And so I want us all to carry this. Okay? I want us to say these words aloud for two reasons. One, for many of you guys who are falling asleep to wake up. And number two, for you to really remember what my sermon is about. Okay? Okay, repeat after me. Read the Bible. Okay, ready? Read the Bible. One more time. Read the Bible. Especially for those who are in their second stage of sleep, okay? So if after the service, someone asks you, what was this message about, what would you tell them? To read the Bible. Amen. Now, it might not be a good message, but I promise you, they will know what this sermon is about. So that leads us to the next session. Why in the world should I read the Bible? I mean, <laughs> that's a common question with our sophisticated modern people. I mean, this is, more, this is like a 3,000-year-old book in a different culture. Why should we read it? It seems so odd, Okay. For one thing, you might go to heaven one day, and if you do, you might actually run into one of the people who wrote one of the books. And he might ask you, what do you think about my book? And if you have nothing to say, you're like, you might, what if you run into Malachi? Okay? And you're like, Mr. Malachi, I didn't really get to read your book. It was kind of in a bad place in the Bible. I couldn't find it. Um, sorry. Okay, by the way, are you, are you Italian, Malachi, or Malachi? Okay, anyway, but seriously, this is a unique thing about the book. God uniquely inspired these scriptures. And he, he taught us about the great story of human existence, and, that, and through the Bible, he revealed himself and his character, right? And that's why we read the Bible. So what does reading the Bible do? Let me give you some things. It generates life. It creates faith. It provides guidance. It makes the foolish wise. A.W. Tozer never got a college education. He's considered brilliant and, and, and genius. It makes the weak strong. It makes the discouraged hopeful. It should be one of the first books that you read to your kids along with Dr. Seuss, okay? All right? And so it's, we have a storybook Bible at home, okay? It was one of the first books we read to our kids. And it should be a last book that you read to a dying person. It's so simple and so deep. You know, the, uh, it's interesting. Some of the brightest brides of the world cannot understand the Bible. And some of the most simplest people who are not educated can understand the Bible. You know, the medieval, the early church fathers used to say this, a gnat could swim in it, but an elephant could drown in it. A gnat could swim in it, but an elephant could drown in it, right? I even composed a rap about this for, this, for those young people that love rap, okay? Young people like Phil, who's still into Biggie and Tupac, okay? You know, it corrects the erring, it inspires the daring, it encourages the despairing, it humbles those who are overbearing, okay? Because from this book, you'll learn your identity, and your real spiritual family, and your enemy, your royal pedigree, and your eternal destiny. Okay, it's a terrible rap, okay? But I want you, want you young people to look. Okay, praise God, okay? It's a terrible rap, okay? And you older people, it's like, what's a rap, okay? Is that something you do on Christmas? But anyway, but reading the Bible honors God, and, and it, 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 it worries the devil, right? And I promise you, on your deathbed, there's no other book that will speak to you the way that the Bible does. And you'll, re you'll discover not so much how the world got made as by whom and what for, okay? And if that's not enough, you'll meet Christ who alone created life and conquered death. And you will understand how smart Jesus really is, okay? He was so smart, he didn't have to use big words to get something profound through your heart. Listen, hundreds of thousands of people have sacrificed their lives to make it available and translate to unknown languages. And now over 95% of the world's population has the message of Christ available to them in their language. Listen, whenever I talk about the Bible as my, as my topic, I always bring my King James Version, okay, this old Bible, okay? Because it's so ancient of days. And so no other book comes to this. It's an amazing book. So here's the question I want to ask you, okay? Don't answer. How often do you read it? How often do you read it? 94% of Americans own a Bible, Christians and non-Christians. 
If you own an iPhone, probably even more of a higher percentage. No other book comes close. 94% of you guys don't own Harry Potter. 94% of you don't own Dr. Seuss. Okay? Most homes have multiple copies of the Bible. Okay, this is Christian and non-Christian. This is America. 90% believe it applies to today. 86% believe it is holy. Only 19% of Christians, not non-Christians, in America read it daily. 19%. That's about one-fifth, a little less than one-fifth. Biblical literacy is an all-time low in America. Get this, I'm not kidding. In one survey, 30% of the people who responded believed that Joan of Arc was Noah's wife. Joan of Arc was Noah's wife. I'm not making that up, all right? Our church in the United States, they're not doing so well, okay? We are biblically liter illiterate. While the rest of the world, they're dying for the Bible, okay? And so you wonder why the voices of culture affects us much more than the Bible. Why the voices of culture has our hearts and minds and ears more than the Bible. So you really start to wonder. You ever heard of Pastor Karl Barth, one of the great theologians in the 1940s? He was German. And he actually was one of the few pastors who defied Hitler. Most German pastors either went along with Hitler, un terrible, or they kept silent. This is what Karl Barth said. Take your Bible and take your newspaper and read both, but interpret newspapers from your Bible. But instead, we interpret the Bible through the lens of the newspaper. You see? Exegete the culture through the Bible, not the other way around. Some of you guys, young people, are like, what's a newspaper? Like, I still get paper news, but you know what a newspaper? Think of social media, something with news. And so I think this passage is perfect for our times. And let me give you some, uh, some you know, uh, context. In verses 1 through 9, Paul prophesies about the world, about the last days. And when I say the last days, I'm not trying to scare you that he's going to come tomorrow. Or they, they could mean a thousand years. Okay? It just means our time. And so and let me ask you, do we merely join the chorus of the world's voices? What do we do? How do we live in such an unstable and wicked time? Okay, and so in verse 10, it says, you, however, you live differently, like Paul. And he tells them about his life, endurance, and love. Okay? And in chapter 4, Stephen, if you can put it up. We're not going to put, you know. This is not today's passage, but for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. Some translation says tickling ears. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you keep your head in all situations, endure hardships. My son loves to tickle me. Okay? He's found out that these two areas here tickles me. Most of you, do you like being tickled? Maybe. I don't like being tickled. I hate it. That's why I can never get a massage. Okay, I'm not like Deshaun Watson, okay? I don't like massages, okay? I don't like massages at all. Okay, I, I don't like being tickled. I hate it. But my son knows that, and he continues to get on top of me. Okay? And I can't push him away. He's my kid. I love him, but I just don't like it. But some people like being tickled. And so the culture tickles your ears, what you want to hear. Okay? And Paul is saying, no matter what the world says, we do not change our morals. The culture of the Roman Empire was extremely evil. It was extremely wicked. And he tells Timothy, Timothy was a very timid guy. He's very weary. He's very weak. And actually, he commends him. Listen, you're doing really well. I know you're tired. You're getting attacked from everything. But you're a good man, Timothy. You continue to persevere. And in verse 12, it says, as a Christian, you will be persecuted. Let me, let, me, let me just kind of tell you, like, persecuted? I've never been crucified for my faith. You know, the entirety of church history, we Christians have been persecuted, persecuted in most countries. N not as much in this country, right? right? A lot of it's because we have power. And I think power in Christianity never does well. It's not a good, it's an unholy allowance. The church is most strong when we are weak, Okay. When politics and church go to bed together, sorry for the rough language, church always gets raped, okay? We are most strong when we are subversive, country, uh, subversive uh, culture. And people need to understand this. Politics, the, the apparatus of politics is all about power and manipulation. The church should be loving and humble and kind and generous, especially the people that you disagree with, okay? 
Listen, I'm not telling you for you not to be involved in politics, okay? I'm not telling you not to do that, but you better be more careful than two porcupines giving a hug, okay? You got to be very careful or you'll be hurt and you'll be, you'll be misunderstood. The problem in this country with Christians, okay, is that we have listened to the political narratives, okay, and abided by their beliefs, Democrats or Republicans, more than the biblical narrative. The biblical narrative should guide you, your thoughts and your narrative. You know what they say, if it looks like a duck, swims like a duck, and quacks like a duck, then it's probably a duck, okay? All right, um, same idea. If you look like, oh, I don't know, let me tell you a little joke. You know Beethoven, why did Beethoven get rid of his chickens? Because they kept on saying, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, why did Beethoven get rid of his ducks? Because they kept on saying, bok, bok, bok. Anyway, okay, but it's the same idea. If you look like the world, talk like the world, think like the world, Johann Sebastian Bach, for those who know anything about culture, believe in things like the world and act like the world, you might be from the world. You're no different from the world. Listen, God has called out, called us all to be Christians, and the world is not going to like us very much. But you need to exegete the world through the lens of Scripture as opposed to exegeting Scripture through the lens of the world. Because if you do that, okay, you don't get to pick and choose whatever you tickles your ears. You don't get to pick out what you like and what you don't like. Do you understand what I'm saying? The Bible is completely true. It was completely false. Okay? I'm going to quit being a pastor if two things happen. I'm going to quit. One, if they found the bones of Jesus. Okay? If they found the bones of Jesus, okay, that means he never was resurrected. And this is all a lie. And I was the biggest fool. I will quit. I will resign. Or number two, if, the, if Scripture was ever proven to be untrue, it never has. It is a lion. It has devoured all his prey. I said this before. Remember Voltaire, that great French atheist and philosopher in the 1700s? He said, within 100 years, this Bible will be gone, will be gone, will be useless. No intelligent person will believe in the Bible. You know what happened? One of his houses in Paris became the, uh, the headquarters for the French Biblical Society. God is funny, isn't he? He always wins. You know, I used to speak at a lot of college retreats because back in the day, I used to be really cool, okay? Young people used to like me. I know that's hard to believe, but back in the day, I got invited a lot to college retreats and, I, and they get all excited, right? Especially the last day. And, and, but then I always warned them, hey, you know, after this retreat is over, you're gonna go to the pit. Pittsburgh, but there are people around there. They want to tickle your ears. You have to hold your position. It's great to be pumped up and jumping up and down 48 inches from the air, but one day you're going to go out and those bullets are real. By the way, I think college life, college culture, college schedule is ideal. It's great for spiritual growth. I think it's amazing for spiritual formation because you can live with other Christians, be around other Christians, have Bible study, have time to worship, pray together, okay? I think it's a great time for spiritual growth. I think college life is ideal and great for spiritual death, okay? For, for complete spiritual deformation. <laughs> Hang out with other hedonists. You can live with other hedonists and be with other hedonists. I think it's great for spiritual deformation. But when you graduate after four or five, if you go to K, six or seven years, you will hit the full force of culture. Uh, by the way, in no way am I telling you to live in your little Christian bubble, your little Christian ghetto. Okay, God calls you to be holy, set apart, but also to live in the world, but not of the world. Okay, but when, when you're being faithful to God, God has a wonderful promise to you. Okay, here's the wonderful promise to you. All that desire to be godly will be persecuted. Isn't that very encouraging? All who wants to be godly, you will be persecuted. Not physically, but you'll be laughed at. So how are we to respond? In verse 13, it says that there will be imposters. You know what that word imposters comes from? It, mean, it comes from the word go well, W-A-E-L. Okay, and the word well means magician, wizard, false teacher. It, it means imposter. And that's where we get the word well, like W-A-I-L, for those who can spell, W-A-I-L. It means to someone who howls. Okay, and Paul is basically giving them comically a name. It's because when the imposter magicians came, when Sodom came, when Lord Voldemort or Mayor or whatever, Harry Pothead, what's, what's it, Lord Voldemort? What's the Harry Pothead series? 
Voldemort, okay, when these false magicians come into the city, they will start howling. They start wailing. Listen to us, our voice. Listen to our voice. But then he says in verse 14, you, however, continue to abide. Learn from me. So this is my translation, the C-H-E version of the Bible. Even though there might be a million voices out there, a million saying a million cool things, there's a lot of things in our society that progress us, and that's good. It's good that we created an internal combustion engine for 150 years ago. I don't think any of you guys walked to church, have you? Okay, now we have electric cars as well, and that's good. They're not here. That's good, Elder Carl. That's good, Elder Jay. In fact, that's one of the requirements to be an elder. You have to have an electric car. It's good. Okay, I'm sorry you have a Honda Pilot, but if you hit someone, you beat everybody. But anyway, none of you guys walked here, right? There's no horse stables here, is there? Okay, there's no horse parking here. It's good that we've progressed, okay? Um, it's good to have AC, amen? Okay, instead of just what my parents used to do. I used to live in Georgia, hot and humid in Georgia, right, Jen? It's hot. And back in the day, we didn't have an AC. So we, my dad would have a roll of Korean newspaper and go like this. This is our AC, okay? This is your AC, okay? All right? It, it's good that we have AC. That's good. Okay, someone asked the, that great, the great leader of Singapore, isn't it, Lee Kyung Woo, what, what's the economic uh, secret, economic miracle of Singapore? You know, Singapore is really hot. It's really hot. I've been there. High 90s. Okay, it's near the equator. Someone asked him, what's the secret of this economic miracle in Singapore? And you know what he said? Because back in the day, it was just a small fishing town. You know what he said? It's when the air conditioners start coming to our country, okay? And people started doing business here, okay? It's good that we have a society that's progressed technologically, medically, transportation. Remember the 1880s? President Garfield, a mentor, Ohio, he died. He got shot, but it was his doctor that killed him. He didn't wash his hands. They just messed, up, messed him up. Okay, aren't we glad that medically, technologically, we've progressed? Okay, you single guys who wants to date, don't pick up your date riding in a mule or a donkey unless you look like Shrek. Okay, and your date's name rhymes with B-O. Nah, okay? And so things need to progress. It's good. We need to progress. We need to change on things that God does not speak on, but on stuff that God speaks on clearly on the issue of creation Sin, salvation, the Word of God, eternal life, the Trinity, that does not change. Because the ways and knowledge of God is far superior, far better, and far gooder for humanity than your sophistication and your intelligence. So there are some areas that we do not change on, and God will not change on them either. Listen, this is very important. There's no Gallup poll on God on how you think about Him. There's no spin doctors hired by the kingdom of God on doctrinal matters. He calls for worship of God, not suggestions. You understand? Listen, the Word of God, listen. Some of you, you read the Word of God, you're not going to like it. But you got to have faith. It is best for humanity. If, if you liked everything in the Bible, then he made the Bible in your image, according to your likes, and then he will not be a God. I saw this on Facebook the other day, okay? It says, Vandom Churchgoer, I did not like worship today. Pastor Francis Chan, that's okay. We're not, we were not worshiping you. Right? Random church goer, I did not like worship today. Pastor Francis Chan, that's okay. We were not worshiping you. Do you understand? This church is not about you. It's about him. So he, Paul tells Timothy, stand your ground, Timothy. And in verse 15 and 16, he kind of tells us the nature of the scripture. That was holy writing. It was inspired by God. He says, you continue for what you learn from your mother, Eunice, which is a great name, and your grandmother, Lois. And he's saying that your heroes, your mama and your grandmama. And from his infancy, Timothy was taught the scriptures from his grandmother and his mother. How many of you have godly grandmothers? Okay? How many of you? They've gone through so much suffering, Right? especially if they're from an Asian country, okay? They've gone through a tremendous amount of country. I mean, it's a tremendous amount of suffering. And yet we learn from them. We believe, we knew it from them, scriptures. We learn from them. And then eventually we had your own faith and you, you, you believed in it. And then now Paul is calling us to continue in it. You know, my mother is a hero of the faith. My mother, who she's 86 years old, born in 1986, on June 1st, UN Children's Day, okay? 
And uh, when I was far away from God in my college years, when I thought I was so smart, smarter than my parents, my mom, <laughs> she would go in a closet. It was one of those closets that you can hear anything anyway. She did this purposely. And she would pray out in Korean, and I understand 70%, 80%. She would say, you know, my, you know, Je, my name is Je, she was Jegun, is my name. She would say, Jegana. She would pray out loud, oh God, help my son. He is so far from you. And she would do it purposely, knowing I was in the other room. She would pray out loud, oh God, he is so dumb. God, bring him back. He thinks he knows more than you. He is so dumb. Okay? But I will share those stories with my kids because my mother is a hero to me and to my kids. It was her prayers that made me learn and have faith and continue in the faith. So that's the chronological steps of, of, of being a child of God. Know, learn, believe, and continue. And that means when that little one goes to college, that little one that costs you $80,000 a year, okay, that you call an investment, but it's more than an expense, okay? These whalers and howlers in college would start saying all these, like, cool things. These professors with horn-rimmed glasses who are so cynical and skeptical are going to say all these cool things. And your mommy and daddy needs to be spiritual heroes. You ought to be a living Bible in them. Listen, the most effective atheists are those who are raised in a church home where there was a disconnect between what they saw at church of their parents and what happened really at home. You know, there's a great story of this pastor's kid. Okay, this pastor had a tendency of walking outside the neighborhood by himself and praying. He walked and prayed. So one day, they couldn't find their four-year-old son. He was lost. They looked everywhere and they found him walking outside by himself. So what are you doing? We worried about you. You're four years old. He says, I'm just walking and praying like my daddy. You see, they learn things from us good and bad. So are you a spiritual hero to your kid? Listen, when you meet Christ face to face, you know, what are you going to say to him? You're going to, you're going to dispense your accomplishments? Oh, I did it. He's going to, okay, whatever. Okay. You think he's going to be impressed that you're the CEO of Apple? Okay. Okay. Tim Crook. I mean, Tim Cook. Okay. Joe Bozo, whatever, from Amazon. Okay. You think he's going to be, uh, Jeff Bezos, whatever. You, you think he'll be, no, he's going to ask you, have you been faithful? Are you a living Bible to your kids? Are you a spiritual guy? Are you leading your kids to the faith? And so he tells Timothy, continue in the faith of your mama, Eunice, and your grandmother. And in verse 15 and 16, he says this, we are to have a lofty view of the Bible, okay? He says it's the only wisdom that leads to salvation. Listen, man left to himself, woman left to himself, cannot write the Bible, okay? If it's left to ourselves, it always leads to just good works, incarnation, pantheism, philosophy, mysticism. Man and women will eventually just glorify themselves. It's all going to be about you find yourself. But the Bible is a book that, I love this quote, the Bible is a book that man would not write if he could write it, and a book that he could not write it if he wanted to write it. Did you hear that? The Bible is a book that man would not write it if he could write it, and a book that he could not write it if he wanted to write it. You understand? Humans by themselves cannot invent the Bible. I'm so, aren't you so glad that our culture has outsmarted the Bible? Okay? Aren't you glad? And it says here further that God's, the Word of God is inspired. It's the same idea as Genesis 1, breathe into man. That means whenever a person speaks, he uses his breath, right? Every morning when I wake up, I, I, I speak this word in my head. K -k -k -k. It's my breath. It's Che breathe. K -k 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 coffee. K -k 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 coffee. Okay. Coffee. That's my first. Coffee. My, my son, I told you this. My son actually asked me several times, do you love me more or coffee? And when he asked my, me that question, I paused. I'm just kidding. Okay. I, 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 okay. I, I love my son more. But I did pause. Okay. Because I was not paused because... The answer wasn't clear. It's just I was kind of overwhelmed by the question, okay? When I speak, it's che breathe. It's my breath. <sighs> Lately, I've been smelling like Phil, not Kim. Thank God. He's not here. Phil's coffee because, you know, Claire might give it to me as well, but then Lydia and Joe gave me Phil's coffee, but I smell like Phil's coffee, okay? 
I don't, my, but my words are not inspired. My words are not infallible. Have I ever gone to you and say, thus saith the word, John? Thus, I'm, thus saith Che. Do I ever go to you? Thus saith Che. Jade, can you give me this? Or thus saith David. Or thus saith Esther. Do I say that? Because my words are not God breathed. That word God breathed comes from Theonoustos. It means basically the spirit of God, the breath of God. He's giving the nature of the Bible the highest status. He's saying that when you read the Word of God, you are reading the very breath, the very lips of God. Okay, this is called the high view of Scripture. It is the inspired Word of God. And not only that, it also is profitable. It can rebuke you. It can train you. It can convict you. How many of you guys have ever heard a message, maybe even me, where you thought, oh my gosh, Pastor Che has been reading my mail. He's been, he's been a fly in the wall of my house. Or he, maybe he's heard me in the middle of the night as I speak to myself. Or maybe, maybe you elbow your spouse and say, did you tell Pastor Chase something about me? How many of you guys have done that? It's not me. It's the Word of God. It's convicted you. It's revealed something to you. It says the Word of God will go down to your marrow and your joints and your bones and reveal the secrets of your heart. It will convict you. And then it says it will train you. It will the Word of God will train you. It's the word where we get the word pedagogy. You know what pedagogy is? Okay, my kids are learning piano and violin, like all good Asian kids, okay? And the, the, it's pedagogy, okay? And so it will completely reorient you. That's how Bible, Paul saw the Bible. It will reorient how you look, view the world. It will transform you, and the Bible will change you if you let the Bible change you. So next time you read the Bible, don't just say this. Open your word to me. That's good. Don't say that. But a greater prayer would be this. Open me to your word. Open me to your word. Destroy my arrogance of what I think the Bible should say. It's open me to your word. It's a true story. About 100 years ago, there was a Welsh steel worker, and he was an alcoholic. He was abusive to his wife and his kids. And one day, he accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior and Lord. And all his friends, his old cronies in crime, used to make fun of him. He said, do you really believe that God changed water into wine? And he's like, yeah, I believe it. Because in my house, he turned liquor into furniture. Uh -huh. He turned liquor into furniture. Because all the extra money, all the money I used to spend on liquor, now my wife uses it for furniture. Okay? And the point is this. My life has changed so much, and now my home has changed so much, and my wife has changed so much, and my living room has changed so much. That's how the Bible changed him. So when you read the Bible, pray, open the word to me, but also open me to your word, okay? Listen, I'm going to be very clear. I'm going to be very personal now. KCPC, there are howlers and wailers out there, okay? And I'll be very honest we are illiterate, biblically, many of us. Many of us have heard hundreds of sermons. Preaching of the, the word is not to be a substitute to your own reading. We are to be a supplement. Do you understand? For many of us, the only time you read the Bible is on Sunday. Okay? And that's why you're swayed by the winds of culture. That's why you're like, oh, that sounds so good. Oh, yeah. I'll believe this. Oh, yeah. That's cool. It's a cool thing to do. You have no foundation. You have no convictions because you never, you don't really word, read the Word of God. You don't think, and I'll talk about this next week. The formations in your head and your mind, your heart is formed by what you listen to and what you see and what you believe in, what tickles your what tickles your ears. Okay. In my former church, it had a lot of strengths and weaknesses. Anna Sabayos knows. Our church, our strength is energy. Our young people, those who are 53 and younger, very young, we have a lot of hunger here. Okay, my other church, they're more outreach oriented. But honestly, there's some judgmentalism, narrow mindedness, and they become, I think they were way too political, to be honest. And un un unfortunately, I think they align themselves to a particular uh, party of, the, of, of our nation. And, uh, but they're older people, they're very biblically literate, very literate. I preach differently there. Okay, I don't know if there's old sermons of me at Scranton Road Bible Church. I preach way different. One thing, I preach much longer, so you're blessed. They want it longer. 
especially the black Americans, they're like, why are, we, why are you only preaching 45 minutes? We want an hour and a half. I'm like, oh, are you serious? Okay. Okay, one time, Tommy and Jamie, they're not here. They heard a sermon without AC in July in Scranton Road Bible Church for 81 minutes. So aren't you glad? Okay. I preached differently there. I was much more exegetical. I was much deeper in Scripture. And I'll probably get there. But we need to be more little, uh, biblical literate. I really do. You young people, no one has outsmarted the Word of God. This is the, this is the book of God. Okay? And there's some things that you just do not change. They're the absolute truth of God. So next time you read a newspaper or social media or TikTok or Instagram or Facebook, whatever you, news that you get, put it next to the Bible. You exegete this through the lens of Scripture, not the other way around. You don't get to pick and choose whatever you want to tickle your ears. Because there's a lot of howlers out there. There's a lot of wailers out there. There's a lot of Sodomon. There's a lot of Lord Vortemort, whatever. Okay? Listen. But you, however, you stick with Jerusalem. You stick with Antioch. Don't worry about the gatekeepers, the fellows from Hollywood or Bollywood or Dollywood or any wood that get, eventually his ideas will be burnt up and be temporal. But you stay with the Bible, all right? Because it's eternal and it's true. Because I can find no better system, no better word. In fact, Dallas Willis said, if Jesus Christ himself can find a better book, a better system, he will live by that system. But there is no better system. There's no better system of morality, salvation, and how to live life. No other book explains the creation of the universe, life, civilization, that answers the important questions of life, sin, evil, redemption, and even life to come. KCPC, we need to continue with the ancient of days. Do you understand? Because in the day of whalers and howlers, may we stand true and be courageous because the world will think we are nuts. Okay? But who cares? May I be a fool in Christ, because that's the truth of Christ. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for your, the word of God. It is living. It is God-breathed. It is perfection. Forgive us when we pick and choose what we want to hear according to the ideals of culture. Father, we pray for biblical literacy in our church. Not only do we just listen to it once a week, we'll be reading scripture daily, not out of guilt or condemnation and not to be legalistic about it, but it is your love letter to us, your love letter to us, how to live life. So we thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. At this time, if we could all stand up and worship. Change. 
the Lord has promised good to me. His word, my hope, secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. My chains are gone. chains are gone my chains are gone I've been set free my God my Savior has ransomed me and like a flood his mercy reigns unending love amazing grace can do immeasurably more than we can possibly ask or imagine. To him be all the glory, honor, and praise. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.